you know, I get so much grief for that song. I think it's great. Uh, maybe sometime we'll have to go back to some uh, Brazilian jazz. But you know what? Uh, I'm an old guy, and uh, old guys like old music sometimes. Thank you so much for uh, your interest uh, last week. It was a very much needed uh, vacation time for me. Um, Gilbert, if you'll show slides 20 and 21, we will. Um, there we go. So we went to uh, <clears throat> Tetons National Park. We did a couple of really good hikes. One of them started at 6,000 feet, went up to 8,000 feet uh, into a beautiful wind tunnel cave. A um, couple of guys came walking out of the cave. They had entered it about half an hour down in a thing called the ice cave. So just beautiful, beautiful country. Uh, <clears throat> I was with a group of guys that um, had similar belief systems. Uh, both in terms of uh, spirituality and um, in terms of interest in not dying quite yet. Uh, so they had a lot of interest in questions uh, for me and what I do. One of them brought up the uh, the Book of Job and the uh, the Christian and the uh, the Christian Bible, the the Jewish uh, uh, Old Testament, where uh, Job was just really really mad. Everything. Uh, a lot of bad things that happened in his life. And he starts fussing at his maker, complaining. And the maker doesn't really answer his question. And well, he answers the question, but he answers the question with a lot of other questions. And that is, where were you when I made Leviathan? And it's like, you know, where were you when I spanned out the planets? Uh, who's the father of snow and rain? And you go into Yellowstone and you see the, you know, it's it's a once in a in the world kind of place. The the crust of the earth is in one of it's very thin there. And you get all of these mud pots. You get the geysers. That's where Old Faithful is. If uh, if you're not connecting the dots yet. And then, you know, the huge herd of American bison that just walk right up to your vehicle. So it helps really put things back into perspective, which I needed after the Alabama project and uh, a lot of significant challenges over the past two years, uh, not to mention a thing called a pandemic and uh, a lot of haters beating up on me for uh, talking about vaccines. So it was a great week. I really appreciate uh, your interest and support of uh, Jesus and uh, David Mites. They got a lot of support. I got a lot of uh, comments from folks saying, hey, that was a great topic talking about brain health. So, <clears throat> yes, David and, uh, and Jesus did a, a great job covering that. Um, more recent topics that we've covered, uh, the good and the bad and the ugly in terms of supplements. Supplements are very, very popular. Sometimes they can kill you. Sometimes they don't help. And sometimes they do help a whole lot. So you need to know a little bit more about supplements before you, uh, before you just take a whole bunch of them. Uh, we, speaking of supplements, vitamin K2 is a very popular supplement for a lot of people that are interested in it. And I've got a slightly different approach to the science and the evidence on K2. So uh, those are things that we've covered over the past few weeks. I don't think I mentioned what we're going to be covering today. It's one of my favorite topics. In fact, I wrote a book on it. And that's why stress tests don't predict heart attacks. There was a celebrity that just announced a few months ago that, yep, I had a stress test. They told me I had the arteries of a 20-year-old college soccer player. And then a few months later, I had a heart attack. So... What's that all about? We're going to talk about what that's all about, uh, but let's cover a little bit more information about what you can get on our channel and how you can take control of your risk for heart attack, stroke, the things that kill us and disable us. First of all, we need to recognize that uh, this is not me saying it. This is the routine uh arbiters and judges of good medicine in at least the U.S., uh, Hopkins, Mayo, uh, other, other research-oriented folk 
have started coming out over the past couple of years with just how good is your typical family practitioner, internist, uh, cardiologist at understanding what drives heart attack and stroke at understanding the, um, how to diagnose prediabetes, diabetes, how to care for it. And their answer and the evidence is pretty clear, about a third. So you depend on your doctor alone to deal with this issue, like the vast majority of folks do. And it makes sense, you know, they're the experts in the area. Unfortunately, your odds are not so good. They're about one in three that you're gonna get good advice there. So uh, here, uh, what I would suggest is you just invest a few hours. I've got uh, four courses. One of them is a general overview. It's about uh, 12 hours. If you don't want to invest that kind of time, just look at components of the other three. They're about an hour and a half to two hours each. Uh, If you can't pay the 20 to 40 bucks that they cost, let Michelle know. We'll get them to you for free. What we want you to do is be able to understand what's going to what your biggest risk for heart attack and stroke is. Uh, insulin resistance, prediabetes, diabetes. Again, that's the thing that two thirds of docs in the U.S. supposedly one of our best uh, healthcare healthcare manpower uh, groups. Two thirds of them don't know how to deal with it. Don't know how to di- diagnose it, let alone deal with it. Then there's a thing called plaque, where that's a big part of what we're going to be talking about today when we say, you know, the standard for evaluating plaque risk of heart attack is to do a stress test, put somebody on a treadmill or an indoor bike or give them a drug that increases their heart rate and see if there's any evidence of problems with the heart. That seems like it would work, right? Yeah, it may seem like it would work. But it doesn't. And we'll talk about why it doesn't a little bit later uh, in the the uh, long program today. We'll also end up with a couple of comments about, well, if stress test doesn't predict a heart attack, what does? Cardiovascular inflammation is a big deal in terms of this stuff. Cardiologists have recognized that. I, I think I think we're going to have an a image in one of our slides, if not today, within a few weeks, maybe next week. Cardiologists have been talking about cardio, uh, cardiovascular inflammation for almost 20 years. It was, it was the cover story in, I think, Time Magazine, what, almost 20 years ago. And what's still happening is when Paul Ridker from Harvard or Gavin Blake or one of these guys that really focuses on the research on cardiovascular inflammation and they do a study like the COMPASS trial. They present their data at these global cardiology conferences and these cardiologists start scratching their head and they say, dang, you know, I I knew that cardiovascular inflammation had something to do with this, but it's always been theoretical. No, it's not theoretical. Come on, guys. Just read a little bit. You know, ask your doc how how much your doctor reads uh, in terms of the new developments in medicine. So uh, if you'd like, if you're interested in our content, but you don't like YouTube, there are other places to get it. Uh, You can support us, by the way, on the, by just joining the uh, YouTube membership component. That's, uh, that would be very helpful. That helps us get this information out all over the world. Uh, but if you're more of a locals and rumble uh, kind of guy or gal, we have locals and uh, and rumble content, uh, a lot of the same content on those channels as well. With the new uh, the new focus in actually accepting Medicare for what we do, uh, we thought that the monthly subscription plans might not last. However, the deeper we get into this, the more we think that it actually will. More to be discussed on that at a later date. Um, You know, we're going to cover just, uh, what, a half hour or less today on why, on one of the biggest prevention myths out there that, oh, you know what? Hey, Doc, you know, to to do like uh, Tim Russert did. Hey, Doc, you know what? I'm having a little bit of cough from my blood pressure medicine. I'm 
my, uh, we're having a little bit of blood pressure problems. It's getting worse. I'm getting my uh, waist size is heading down up towards 40. And let's just get a stress test and make sure that I'm okay. Well, you know, you get a stress test. His was, he passed it with flying colors, which he should have. He's a, he was a runner. And then a few weeks ago, he was recording a, a an intro to his uh, globally televised show. Meet the, is it Meet the Press? Um, the producer walked by, he said, what's happening? And, and killed over and died after that totally negative stress test. So again, we're going to talk about that today. I've got, a, like, as I mentioned, I've got a whole book on it. I've been self-critical in terms of the book saying that it's too technical, but you know what? I, I get a lot of great feedback from the folks that watch this channel that it's not. And you know what? Uh, maybe there's a reason for that. The channel gets somewhat technical too. So a couple of, that was a couple of points about what kind of content you can find with us. Uh, before we move on, um, Gilbert, if you would let Hesos know, we need to do a little bit more of a of an update for folks regarding the um, the uh, Medicare program. Just a couple of points: we've gotten the software up and rolling for our care management program. What what is care management? Basically, it's a way for you to stay in touch with your doctor's office. Um, most doctors don't have this kind of program. Um, it's software driven. And again, most docs have so much to do in their own little world. They're on a treadmill. Here's why they're on a treadmill. It, what, 20 years ago, Medicare started saying, look, we're afraid we're going to go bankrupt. So they start ratcheting back their fee-for-service activities or what they pay for fee-for-service. In fact, fee-for-service uh, pays about 30% less than what it used to. For those of you who are businessmen, you know that, you know, most of the time a business owner lives off of that 20%, maybe 30% um, margin at the end, after you pay your staff, after you pay your expenses. So guess what? Yeah, we've got a lot of docs in the U.S. that are basically working for free because they feel loyalty to their patients, loyalty to their um uh, to their staff and Medicare has cut 20 to 30 percent out of what they're used to billing. So how do they respond? They try to do more fee for service. And that's not the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to focus on the prevention programs, things like uh, care management, chronic care management, CCM, um, it's one of the key things that we're starting. And you have to have a little bit better focus on prevention you have to not be on that um, fee-for-service treadmill. And sure enough, so a couple of things happen. Um, Medicare patients that are getting these preventive services, uh, care management, uh, AWVs, a preventive plan, annual wellness visits, a preventive plan to, to make sure that the patient knows, mm, yeah, I may have insulin resistance, I may have full-blown diabetes, and what am I doing about it on a regular basis, multiple times per week, just a 45 second touch point with the, the medical office staff? It helps patients begin to realize that, well, what, what happens to, for Medicare? These patients end up not going into the hospitals. These preventive programs are not going away. You know, anything and everything Medicare spends money on is attacked politically. But these preventive programs are not getting attacked. Why? Because people are not getting sick. They're not going into the hospital and Medicare is saving Medicare dollars from, not, from patients not getting sick and not going to the hospital. When you look at the programs that we built in Alabama, for example, that was the same thing. I used to say financially that those programs made their money by, quote, picking the pocket of the hospitals. Here was the point. You do the right prevention. You help patients understand this is my health. I don't wait passively for the doctor to give me some medications. 
that's not what's going to protect my health. I have to accept responsibility for my health and I have to work on it every day. These care management programs help people begin to understand that. And um, we're moving ahead with it. We start with uh, our pilot program. We've already started with some pilot patients. Jenny uh, Wolf, our NP, who's got uh, some experience in, um, in bail Dineen exams in a Medicare environment, is doing some backup for Jesus. Uh, Jesus is a physician, uh, a foreign trained physician. He's not going to be practicing as a physician with us, but he's overqualified for what we're doing in terms of managing the care management program. So we've got about 20 patients already getting interactions, giving us information on a daily basis. Again, you may say daily basis, that's too much work for me as the patient. I don't want to do that. We're talking about 45 seconds here. We're not talking about a lot of time. And we're talking about 45 seconds, five days a week to keep you from having a heart attack next year and dying. You know, a little bit of prevention is a big, very big deal. And guess what? We used to think that this was just for people that could afford their own airplanes. That was one of my major frustrations from the time we started this practice until uh, this month, this year. Uh, typical bail dunning practices and programs charge thousands of dollars. We're now being able, we're now able to do this for your routine Medicare compensation. So this is a big, big deal in terms of access to world-class prevention. We'll give you a little bit more information uh, as we develop slides to just let you know when we're going to be rolling out. Okay, when we complete for the state of Florida, when we roll out for the rest of the region, and then, then when we roll out for the rest of the country. Now, let's get to some uh, content. This will be the short uh, one slide uh, for before the, uh, the major content about stress tests. It's about something that the, the guys asked me this past week. It's what is inflammation, cardiovascular inflammation? Why does it matter? And we'll only touch on a little bit of it. We're not going to touch. We'll get some into actual testing in the last slide of our major content today. But what we're going to talk about is the initiating event for cardiovascular inflammation and why um, hyperglycemia is such a big deal. And again, so many people have just not heard of these concepts. And when I say people, I'm including, uh, what, 90, 95% of doctors. As I said, these cardiologists keep scratching their head every time they hear about something with cardiovascular inflammation and the practical impacts. This slide's not going to be so much about uh, practical medicine impacts. This is going to be some core or basic science. And it starts with the glycocalyx and endothelial regeneration. The intima is also called the endothelium. Endo meaning the lining, thelium meaning uh, the lining. Uh, the epithelium, for example, is the external lining. It's the skin. Endothelial lining of the arteries is the internal lining there. It's sort of the skin on the inside. But that skin on the inside has sort of a mucus type of... Um, of consistency. It's actually a bunch of feathery or hairy things, fibers that are sticking out into the uh, artery wall and especially into the capillary wall. What happens is the red blood cells line up side by side like donuts and they pass single cell through the capillary. The glycocalyx brushes over the red blood cells. When it does that, it picks up oxygen from the red blood cells. It drops off carbon dioxide. It picks up uh, glucose and other things that are uh, part, of, uh, part of the metabolic uh, needs, and it drops off uh, metabolic waste. So the health of the glycocalyx is critical. Guess what? 
Let's talk about glycocalyx and what it's made of. Glycocalyx. So calyx mean. Let's break down the words for a second. Calyx means um, like a matrix. Uh, it's a structure that's made up of many fibers. Glyco, we know, means sugar. It's made up of membrane bound or intimacell cell bound proteoglycans. Well, let's break that down for a second. Proteo, you may be guessing already, it means proteins. And glycans, maybe you're guessing already there, it means glucose. So you're, if you're hearing it a couple of times, you're saying, wait a minute, the fibers that make up this critical glycocalyx are developed on a structure of glucose molecules. That's right. And guess what's ha what happens if you bathe fibers made up of a structure of glucose in too much glucose? They start to dissolve, they get sticky, and they get burned away. That is the initiating step of cardiovascular inflammation. With cardiovascular inflammation, you see major loss of the glycocalyx. And we don't have the, uh, the best pictures for that today. I think we'll be covering those pictures of a healthy glycocalyx versus a damaged glycocalyx uh, next week. And it looks like there was a field and somebody came along with a, uh, a weed, um, a weed whacker, a lawnmower, just uh, cut it right off. So let me get back to, this, to, the, uh, to the script here. The endothelial glycocalyx is a network of membrane-bound proteoglycans. And we talked about those two definitions. And glycoproteins. Well, what's the difference between a glycoprotein and a proteoglycan? They both are made up of uh, proteins and glucose components. So the differences for our purposes are not significant. They cover the lumen or the, the hole where the flow is in the vessels. Experimental evidence shows that loss of the glycocalyx is involved in dysfunction of the vascular system. In other words, it's the initiating step for um, inflammation. Some trials have shown benefits on glycocalyx precursors such as arteriosyl and endocalyx pro. Somebody brought that up. A couple of people asked us about those things over the past few weeks. And it's like every time I approach a new supplement, I think, yeah, this is going to be, pardon the term, bullshit. But no, it's not. Uh, these, I spent a couple of hours looking at these, uh, these items and they're developed. They've got some pretty good... Uh, uh, information, some pretty good uh, evidence behind their products. And I don't get any compensation from these guys, by the way, if you're worried about that. They looked at increased vascularity, regeneration of the glycocalyx, and uh, uh, there's a case to be made for application for cardiovascular disease. I haven't bought any yet. I'm, uh, I'm focused on some other ways of helping uh, preserve my cardiovascular system some mostly lifestyle related items, but a couple of other things as well. I have had arteriosil in the past. Um, so if you'll give us the water ball, we will get into our topic for the day, why stress tests don't prevent heart attacks. <music> So another celebrity. Now, if you ask, if you had asked me who Brad Upton was um, two weeks ago, I wouldn't have known. He's a comedian. He had a um, sign quote, significant end quote, heart attack, despite normal cardiac stress tests. And uh, that came out and it was what to know. And so Jesus and I communicated. We do want to keep getting that message out there about don't depend on a stress test to predict a heart attack. Brad Upton obviously didn't listen to us, and he's obviously regretting that at this point. Um, we've had folks on the show who said exactly that. Uh, 
Someone else in show business, uh, Daniel Trevor, came on the show and talked about that. He said, my outsides looked great. He's, uh, he's done a lot of video. He owns a, uh, um, a skin uh, care company. And he'd always kept in great shape, but he said, and my arteries were, were in really bad shape internally. I didn't know it. Ended up with a heart attack, and that's how I discovered uh, Dr. Brewer's channel. So let's, uh, let's maybe get some help, get some other folks out there understanding the health on the inside instead of just the outside. So back to the script, uh, heart of a 20 year old athlete, Brad Upton suffered a significant heart attack on Memorial day after a normal cardiac stress test about eight months prior. Last September, when my esophagus was giving me chest pains, this is the quote from Brad. I took the treadmill test. They told me, ah, I'm, my heart was fine. It was just my esophagus. And I had the heart of a 20-year-old college soccer player. He posted that on Facebook. Monday, May 30th of this year, my right coronary artery was 100% blocked and required three stents to open it up. So... Um, I don't know all the details of Brad's case, but it sounds like for many of you that know the story, most stents, as in 90% of stents, are put in to, quote, prevent a heart attack, and they don't do that. 10% of stents can be life-saving if the stent is put in during the heart attack because you're finding the clot and you're removing that clot at the time that you're putting the stent in. And that's what it sounds like happened with Brad Upton. So for those of you who think that I really don't like stents, uh, stents can be life-saving. 10% of them that are, uh, that are put in now are life-saving. The other 90% are, not only are they a waste of medical resources, the biggest, I, I, I'm not even worried about that. Here's what I'm worried about. The mistaken assumption that, oh, I've got my plumbing fixed, my, I've got that stent in, I'm good to go. No, you're not. That's not gonna prevent your heart attack. You're the only one that can prevent your heart attack. Now let's go back and talk about stress tests. What is it? Well, <clears throat> it's a procedure used to measure how the heart works during physical activity, pardon the typo there. These typically involve assessment of heart function while exercising on a treadmill, exercise bike, or even use of adenosine, which is a drug which makes your heart beat really fast. That's for people that have, um, uh, for one reason or another, like a paralysis, cannot uh, function on a stress test or, a, or an exercise bike. The American College of Cardiology, the American and the uh, American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation, and the college, the American College of Family Practitioners, get this, all agree that stress tests are grossly overutilized for heart attack prevention. They're just, we do too many of them. And why? Well, you know, why is it your doctor telling you that this is not the way to find out if you're going to have a heart attack? Well, stress tests demonstrate high risk of false positive and false negative results, primarily when used to predict heart attack and stroke. They're really good at, at uh, demonstrating um, exercise tolerance. In fact, with Tim Russert, that's exactly what it demonstrated. He had great exercise tolerance. But the unfortunate part is the assumption that good exercise tolerance means you don't have cardiovascular inflammation, you don't have a soft plaque, you don't have clots cooking in your vascular system. And that assumption is incorrect. Uh, Tim Russert and all these other folks that, that uh, have had heart attacks after negative stress tests are great examples of why, of how and why uh, exercise tolerance is not the same thing at all as cardiovascular, a lack of cardiovascular inflammation. 
So stress tests, back to the script. Other names and types include stress EKG, exercise EKG, exercise electrocardiogram. Uh, there's just a bunch, a bunch of other names. Uh, key components include uh, nuclear. The vast majority are nuclear now. And, you know, back in the old days when you were just doing a, uh, a stress EKG, those were like three or 400 bucks. Again, they were fairly inexpensive, but because they had so many false positives, so many false negatives, um, and just Google it. Go to a Google search page and look up uh, percentage of false positive, percentage of false negative stress tests, and you'll see we're talking about 15 20% and higher on both sides of that. So once you get an answer from it, what does it mean? Well, so what the doc, did the medical community do? They plowed straight ahead in this assumption that, that this is exercise tolerance is going to give you a great prediction for heart attack and stroke. It does give you some, but it's a very flawed prediction. So they said, well, you know what? We'll get better results if we add nuclear or echo to the thing. And they did add uh, what? five, 10, 20,000 and more dollars in terms of uh, increased cost and a little bit of improvement in the predictive value of a positive. What's the predictive value of a positive? It's impacted by the prevalence of real disease and the uh, sensitivity specificity of the test. That gets a little bit too epidemiology, techno geeky that I've covered this actually a couple of times on the channel, but we're not going to go there today. Bottom line is it's not a great test. Here's one of the, here's some of the problems with a, with a stress test. The concept behind stress testing is simple. The fatal flaw, literally fatal is the, it was fatal for Tim Russert. It's been fatal for many, many others. It's the mistaken assumption that plaque must impede the flow of blood in the arteries in order to cause danger. And if plaque is in there and it's not impeding the flow, that you're safe. That is a mistake. And again, it's been lethal for many, many people. 30 to 66 percent of heart attacks occur in people with less than 50 percent occlusion. And you've got to have 50 percent occlusion or more for it to impact the flow of blood. So as you can see, most most uh, places like Princeton would say, over half of people that have heart attacks did not have significant occlusion of blood flow. So then once you get deeper, even the actual indicators of ischemia or loss of blood flow are really not that clear. You can get things like breathlessness, nausea, dizziness, chest pain, problems on the EKG curve or rhythm, such as uh, you know, enlarged heart abnormalities, leaky heart, it's, it's just going into an area where there's just a lot of lack of clarity. From this, um, this article back in Heart Magazine 2012, Johns Hopkins, stress testing and non-invasive uh, angiography in patients, uh, time for a new paradigm. Uh, you suspect coronary artery disease, let's start thinking about something else. And let me, let me point out something. This was 10 years ago. Folks at Johns Hopkins, have people stopped doing stress tests? No. Uh, to, the, uh, to the text or the, the captions on this, the script, numerous studies reported accuracy, end quote, uh, in air quotes, or, of stress testing to identify patients with obstructive coronary artery disease, which they defined as 50% uh, occlusion or more. St stenosis is another term for occlusion. Diagnostic accuracy studies using cardiac cath, they're subject to referral bias. And that is, uh, it's inflated by, uh, and there's sensitivity and specificity problems. Again, I'm not gonna get into the uh, details of those, those technical aspects of the, of, the, of the test process. At least 20% of stress tests are either false positive or false negative. So it gets back to that 
if you think if you're going to get a stress test and you're going to rely on that to tell you, do you have a risk for heart attack? You got to ask yourself, are you feeling lucky? According to available evidence, almost 70,000 people suffer MI or heart attack, cardiac death the year after a normal nuclear stress test. So go back to Harvard Health. Uh, I mean, again, uh, I'm not the only guy saying this. This is uh, uh, this is Harvard and some other guys that folks really rely on. Sudden death is not always so sudden. The Hollywood picture is this is a bolt. This sudden cardiac death is like a bolt out of the blue. Think about it. It's more like real lightning. Uh, when do you really see a lot of real lightning out of a totally clear blue sky? You don't. You see lightning come out of a sky that's black, dark, got lots of clouds and wind and rain. In other words, there's a storm going on. That's when you see lightning. And guess what? That was their point here, that th they were quoting a, a study done by a, a German university prior to that who was looking at sudden cardiac death. And they said, it's not sudden. It's preceded by a metabolic storm. We'll talk about how to look at that metabolic storm in just a minute. But again, Paul Ridker, Gavin Blake, tons of other uh, cardiovascular researchers have been talking about this for over 20 years, almost 30 years now. And unfortunately, our medical community just still hasn't gotten to it. You might say, well, you know, Ford, that is, you know, the stuff that you covered a few minutes ago was old, uh, 10 years old, uh, 10 years or older. Things have changed. Uh, we're better off now. <laughs> no, we're not. Uh, you know, these are just some pictures of some celebrities that many of us know. I don't keep up with a lot of media, but I do know about James. I, and actually, I've reported on these. Um, James Gandolfini from The Sopranos, Gary Shandling, uh, Davy Jones with The Monkees. Uh, many of you in my generation may remember back then he had a heart attack as well, and I think he died with his I can't remember the name of this game show guy, but that made a lot of press as well. This one is uh, Bob Parker, uh, LP Little A, the trainer for The Biggest Loser. And this is Rosie O'Donnell. Um, if you're say, looking at some of these like Gandolfini and Rosie and say, well, they were heavy. You know, you, you get thin, you're not going to have this problem. Getting thin helps a whole lot. But does anybody remember Susan? Is it Susan Lucci? You know, the the queen of the the mean queen in a lot of uh, soap operas. She announced a couple of years ago that she had a heart attack, too, and she was very, very thin. So you got to know what your risk is. You got to know what your core um, uh, driver of heart attack and stroke is. And sure, it's. Uh, it's insulin resistance for many of us. That's driven mostly by aging, but it's also driven by uh, body fat. Things, you know, we can't do much about aging, but we can do stuff about the, you know, our body composition. But, you know, you look at somebody like Bob Harper, early 50s when he had his heart attack, it wasn't body fat for Bob. It was LP to little a. So first you need to assess the situation. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But again, I got to get back to the point of, well, we thought we had conquered heart attack. Well, a lot of people thought that we'd made huge progress, and we did. You look at the, the death rates um, for cardiovascular disease over the past, what is this, since 1900. Increased up until about 1960 and then started coming down dramatically. Look at that. But guess what? Just over the past few years, that curve, uh, that straight line going down, even though I mean, even though it's been going down for the past what 50 years, um, it was still 
cardiovascular disease were two of the top three causes of death, heart attack and stroke. And clearly, um, one of the top three causes of, uh, of uh, permanent disability, you know, very, very destructive. So we thought we were going to get it to where it was no longer the number one cause of death right before it crossed over that line, which was about here. And I think the other cause of death was a, more of a general cancer, but somebody fact checked me on that. Right before it crossed over and, and heart attack became no longer the number one cause of death, we got that break in that curve and it started going back up. And here's what was what's ominous about it. It's similar to what's happening with colon cancer. We're starting to see this a lot in people less than 50 years old. This was in a Wall Street Journal article just a year or two ago, and I reported on that. So this was a, a gentleman less than 50 years old, left behind a young wife and two uh, teenage daughters. So, yep, we still have a long way to go. Now, I've mentioned it many times. If stress test is not the way to predict a heart attack, how do you pre predict a heart attack? You look for that metabolic storm. Well, how, how do you look for a metabolic storm? Look for cardiovascular inflammation. So uh, how do you look for cardiovascular inflammation? Uh, the, there are a few docs that are now doing a C-reactive protein, but C-reactive protein is one of many tests in, car in the cardiovascular inflammation space, and it has the most biological false positives. What do I mean by a biological false positive? It's an inflammatory protein made by the liver. Uh, if you get a cut on your ankle, you, that can increase it. Um, flu vaccines. If we take 100 people today, give them a flu vaccine, 66 of them will have an elevated C-reactive protein 48 hours from the vaccine. So that's a biological false positive. There are other tests, and I, and I do recommend including other tests in a panel of cardiovascular inflammation. We've talked about that. Um, if you have interest, we can uh, go into that uh, more deeply at a later point. Cholesterol profile. Yeah, it actually does matter, or at least it helps us understand something. And it's not so much the cholesterol itself. For people with familial hypercholesterolemia, that's uh, cholesterol values, you know, uh, LDL values, 250, 300, 350, it matters. It doesn't really matter so much for most of us. So why do I have that listed? Here's why. When you look at the fractionation, that tells us, a, well, and when you look at the panel, it tells us about the number one and most common cause. It tells us about our carb metabolism. For example, the first thing I look at when a patient comes to me and they've not gotten a complete evaluation, they've just got a usually a cholesterol panel and their doc is continuing to perseverate over cholesterol. I'll look at the triglyceride over HDL. And triglyceride over HDL is a major telltale sign, biomarker for the most common problem, which is carb metabolism issues. In the fractionation, we see a bunch of other things too, like uh, loss of those large fluffy LDLs, which are healthy. You know, you hear this uh, ongoing debate. And yeah, if you're reading my nonverbals, it's true. I get so tired of that ongoing debate of, well, is LDL really bad or is it good for you? You know, and you got, what is his name? Amir or something talking about, you got to have a high LDL. You got to have a high LDL. Then you got everybody else in the standard medical community saying, no, you got to have low LDLs. And we've gotten them down to 25s and that helps. And 120 LDL is really a big problem. Well, again, there's a reason I'm doing this. And it's because like so many times, humans, we humans are like the six blind men and the elephant everybody's got, everybody's right. You know, all, all these folks are right, but they're, they're wrong as well. Now, what do I mean by that? So LDL, large fluffy LDL is healthy for you, but small dense LDL is not. So that's why we look at things like fractionation. You also get a lot more uh, understanding about the HDL uh, population. Same thing, large fluffy HDL are, uh, are healthy. 
uh, the small HDL or not so much. Now, why? what's happening there? Well, if you got dis, uh, disabled or, or defective carb metabolism, there's several things that happen. Number one, you tend to have, you tend to be pushing out too much insulin. Well, if you're constantly pushing out insulin, insulin not only takes blood sugar out of the blood where it's harmful and puts it into the liver and, and muscle cells where it's healthy, it also stops fat burning. You know, that's the whole thing. The insulin is all about getting you to decrease your blood sugar. So one of the things it does is it stops you from burning fat. Well, guess what? If you're constantly 24 hours a day, like the, a person with early insulin resistance, 24 hours a day pumping out too much insulin because your, your insulin receptors are pushing back, then you get to where you're not able to burn fat. And unlike a teenager who may eat a whole lot um, and they sit, stay skinny, they're living off of their fat stores. You, if you're insulin resistant, you start getting fat and it's not because you're eating more. In fact, you're eating more because you're getting fat because you can't burn that fat because your insulin stays too high all the time. So maybe I'm getting a little bit too deep on that. Let me get back to the script. Root causes. We talked about root causes um, a couple of times. Insulin resistance, diabetes, prediabetes, over 80% of us, that is the root cause. And when you say, you know, pardon me, I'm holding my head so many times because there's so many times we've dealt with these same debates. Well, my A1C is great. The vast majority of people that, ha that I see that have full diabetes have A1C levels five and a half or less many of them below five. So how can that be? Wait a minute. A1C is the test for diabetes, insulin resistance, right? I can pretty much guarantee you that just about anybody that has a, uh, an A1C of in the five and a half and above is putting down plaque. Just look at the, you know, uh, having an average of 140 uh, American units for blood glucose uh, appears to be where we really start laying down significant plaque and increasing our inflammation that we talked about earlier. Um, but let me switch back and look at a different, uh, take a different way of looking at how you define what you look at for diabetes and prediabetes. The, again, don't take it from me, take it from the American Association of uh, Clinical Endocrinologists or the, uh, um, the other endocrinology boards and standards committees, they say the same thing. Don't look at A1C alone to make a diagnosis of diabetes. And the reason that they say it um, is not really the most common problem. The reason they say it is that, look, A1C is built on, a, it's a hemoglobin test. Anything that impacts hemoglobin can impact the A1C. For example, uh, genetic pool. You know, folks from the Middle East, folks from Africa, folks from a lot of different places have a different type of, uh, of hemoglobin, uh, that beta thalassemia, uh, sickle hemoglobin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a lot of those in the tropics and subtropical areas, because those tend to improve the human's ability to fight back with malaria. But other things cause hemoglobin problems too, like kidney disease, liver disease, um, pregnancy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, as I said, though, they listed all that, but they didn't list the most common ca cause of a low hemoglobin A1C in a diabetic or insulin resistant person, at least in my practice and in my experience and what I've seen. If you're not eating carbs, you're not likely to push that blood sugar over uh, so high. And so, as I mentioned a minute ago, I've already mentioned it. I've got tons and tons of full-blown diabetics that get that have an A1C at 5.1. So, again, don't rely on A1C. Get a moving picture. Get a true uh, insulin survey, or at least an OGTT oral glucose tolerance test. Now, I, we keep saying 70 to 85 percent of this problem is caused by insulin resistance. What about the others? One of the more common ones is psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. 
these are things that are inflammatory diseases, but they're usually inflammatory in other areas, not usually, you know, a lot of inflammatory diseases don't impact cardiovascular disease, but a lot of them do. If you have full-blown rheumatoid arthritis or somebody in your family does, you have as much risk for heart attack and stroke as somebody that has full-blown diabetes. Most people just don't know that because they don't do this for a living. I've got a lot of patients with psoriatic arthritis. Uh, at least in my practice, it's far more common than, uh, than rheumatoid. But there are other causes, root causes as well, like, as we discussed, LP little a, Bob Harper, familial hypercholesterolemia, not to be confused with lean mass hyperresponder. Um, again, we're touching on so many root causes that I, we just don't have the time today to get that deep into each one. Now, what's another way of looking at that, looking for that metabolic storm? CIMT. You know, there are, uh, there are a couple of better ways than stress tests for looking at plaque. And again, if you have more interest on it, get the book, get the course uh, on plaque evaluation. Here's the one advantage that CIMT had, two advantages that CIMT has over the other ones. The, the criticism of CIMT is that, oh, it's garbage in, garbage out. Well, don't focus too much on arterial age. That's not really the key thing. What we're really gearing on is soft plaque. If it's soft plaque, it can leak back into the blood flow. Soft plaque, inflamed plaque, leaking into the blood flow causes clots. And that is what causes heart attack, stroke. If it's a clot and it's big enough and it goes to the heart, that's a heart attack. That's what happened to Tim Russert. The, after they did the uh, buyout, I mean, the autopsy on Russert, they said the inside of his arteries looked like the pimply face of a teenager with a bad case of acne. And so it was spewing out these little, little dollops of uh, inflamed material, which were forming clots, one of which killed him. So you look at the CIMT, uh, Jesus put, us a, put a good picture of a sample CIMT here. And most folks focus on this. Okay, how? What was the arterial age? <clears throat> and yep, you can focus on that. But again, that just helps you get an early screen. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for soft plaque, and you find that down here under comments. This person does have a, a significant plaque. Anything over one point three is significant, and they've got one at uh, two point oh. But see there, it's echogenic. The time beforehand, it was heterogeneous. What you don't want to see is one that says S for soft. Uh, so what are some other ways of looking for uh, evaluating plaque? Obviously, the calcium score. A um, lot, of, lot of focus on calcium score. Um, it's, a, it's a good screening test. I use it. I don't use it as much as CIMT because it doesn't really tell me about soft plaque but it does give us some better understanding of cardiovascular risk than just doing a stress test. And a real up and comer is CTA, um, CT angiogram. There's less clarity on this, but there's a lot of opportunity and uh, I suspect it's gonna overtake all of them over the next few years. Once we get to where we are not so dependent inappropriately so on stress tests. So thank you for your interest. Um, Gilbert, if you will give us the transition, we'll go into Q&A. <clears throat> so let's go back. Here we go. Uh, a lot of questions. Thank you for your interest. So um, Dwight Baldwin is saying, sometimes after a eating a healthy meal and feeling full, I still crave carbs and sweets. Well, that's welcome to my world. That's where I live. I mean, I grew up in a bad culture in terms of that. How can I prevent this? There's, there are a lot of, a lot of things to do. You know, one of the, one of the things is to eat foods that, that fill you up. Um, so you get that gastric uh, reflex of saying I'm full. The 
problem of that long term is that you know you just stretch the stomach out further and further and further. Another um, thing is to uh, to make sure and eat healthy fats. Uh, healthy fats do tend to improve satiety. Um, another thing to think about is you know what. Uh, you may do some sort of very small uh, dessert. Sometimes that helps you get over that sweets uh, thing. Uh, substitution of, uh, of healthy uh, foods for some of the less healthy desserts. Sharing dessert when you're out with a group. Um, and waiting five to 15 minutes before you actually eat dessert it takes us five to 15 minutes for our satiety to kick in. Good question, Dwight. Thanks. Uh, you know, there's just so much about the tricks of trying to manage what we eat. You know, we're like uh, those old pot belly pigs. We're humans tend, most of us tend to just get into a mode of getting heavier and heavier and heavier. So, oh, if you put us in a space where and a lot of dogs are like this, if you put us in a space where we've got unending access to food, which is where most of us are these days, you really have to figure out, you do some work on trying to restrict that caloric intake. Dwight, again, a doctor told me that GLP-1 can be obtained from compounding pharmacies at a low cost. Is this safe? I'm not sure where he got that. I'm surprised to hear that. It's not a compounded drug. It's a, it's a hormone. It's a glypton. Um, so I'm, I'd be very interested to see where that's coming from. Now, <clears throat> I will say this. I found uh, some access, you know, like some of the other very expensive drugs, I found some access recently in um, one of the, uh, a, a couple of the off- offshore or uh, Canadian pharmacies. I put some information out about that recently. So your typical GLP ones uh, overall cost about $1,000 a month. That's a lot. Um, what I saw was, I think it was Wygovi. It was one of the GLP ones and it was more like 250 a month. So I would go that route before I'd try to find some local compounding pharmacy for that. Good question though, Dwight. Thank you so much. And I would check your source on that. Bart Robinson, good morning. Uh, good to see you again, Dr. Brewer. Good, good to see and hear from you, Bart. Thank you so much for your interest. Dwight, read your book. It was great. See there, uh, uh, I keep thinking it was, well, it is. And I did talk to one of the guys this week uh, that we went uh, with said, yeah, I do use your book to go to sleep. <laughs> So it can get a little bit uh, dull and technical, but believe it or not, the first couple of chapters are really action chapters. We go into uh, a well-known example of sudden cardiac death. But thank you again, Dwight. I do get a lot of uh, good feedback about that. Bambi Grage. Good to hear from you, Bambi. Uh, great to be back. Oh, I forgot to talk about my sleep apnea visit. So, um, here's the thing last night, you know, doing what I do, cardiovascular risk, sleep apnea is a big deal, a really, really big deal. And the vast majority of my patients as in a hundred percent for the past couple of years are now telemedicine patients. So one of the things I've been looking for for a long time is a access to telemedicine sleep, uh, stuff. And, I've got a significant sleep problem myself. I've made significant improvements. Uh, one of the reasons for my sleep apnea problem is I have a high arch. You can't see any, much, anything back there, but we're talking about the arch of the soft and hard palate. That means that usually happens because my jaw is squeezed in. Um, what happens for those of us with a high arch, it tends to push our tongue, the back of our tongue back into our airway, causing sleep, sleep apnea when we're asleep. Uh, believe it or not, uh, I do a lot of work with dentists because of their focus in this area. 
and I got, uh, I did an Invisalign and I used to have my lower teeth, especially where they were just bunched over in front of each other. And now they're not because the Invisalign spread that lower jaw out. That helped significantly. At one point in time, I did use an oral device. Oral devices pulled the lower jaw down and forward. Um, they also can cause underbite problems. And sure enough, I actually started um, getting some TMJ, t uh, temporomandibular joint issues and some issues where my the incisors were bucking against each other instead of uh, sliding like they were supposed to. And that's, you don't want to have that going on. So I stopped taking that, uh, using that oral device. Um, side sleeping helps a lot of us. And sure enough, I started doing a lot of side sleeping, got a big improvement. Um, I did a watch pat. Uh, here, here's a watch pat. I will go, I've got it here. I'm planning on going into details when we go a little bit more deeply into my sleep apnea story. Uh, this, this has a, uh, a thing for your finger for pulse uh, oximetry to measure your oxygen levels. It also has uh, something here to put over your wrist uh, for timing and keeping the data. And then it has uh, a, a device that you tape right over your uh, sternal notch. It records snoring, vibration, and loss of uh, breath. I actually, um, there's a company now, there's a group, it's called Dream, D-R-E-E-M, and I don't get any compensation from them either, but I a friend of mine was working with them and asked me if I would uh, take a look at what they do. And it was a good, it was a good evaluation. The doctor's name was uh, Dr. Tony Masri. Um, you know, he's got his quirkiness just like the rest of us, but he's a great sleep doctor. And they have taken this watch pad and made significant improvements in it. They're actually working with a new device, um, remote device, which is even better. So I will, yes, I did have sleep apnea, but there were some caveats to that. Uh, and we'll talk about those uh, in a few weeks when we get that information. Okay. Dad, you are. Good morning. Good morning, Dad, you are. Tell us where you're from. We would appreciate that. Jonathan Hull. Good morning, Dr. B. Mabu Hai. Mabu Hai is... Uh, a Filipino language for, uh, I think it's live long and prosper. Uh, good life, happy life. Fort Worth West Side, knowing what, that losing excess body fat can be beneficial. How does one know what their ideal weight should be? Ah, ideal weight. That's a challenging concept. Uh, what, um, you know, they, you, you'll hear me do it. it. It's I tend to say you want to be in the uh, low twenties for BMI, and people say, "Oh, that's just too skinny." Your wives start looking at you, and even your you know your spouse says you're too thin. No, you're not. Um, but that's one way of looking at it. The ultimate definitive way of looking at it is DEXA scan. Uh, DEXA technology, uh, what dual electron something. Um, Dexa technology is out there, but here's the problem. It's you see it in a few large cities, but not very many. The people that own these devices just don't make enough money. Now, how does it work? It actually shows you the uh, the amount of muscle and body fat. So you'll see these obese people that have uh, this is their thigh, but their muscles are here. Well, and they may actually be in better shape than someone who's got tiny legs, but their muscles don't start until here. So it's the ratio. It's how much body fat you have. And uh, how do you work on that? Lifestyle, high intensity interval training, uh, decreasing your carbs, uh, making sure that you get that significant insulin, I mean, that significant uh, resistance training. And every year we get past age 30, 40, uh, 
we get more and more opportunity to get cardiovascular inflammation because we're decreasing the muscle component of our body and increasing the fat component. It's all about that ratio. I realize I didn't answer your question. Maybe sort of, some, somewhat. Uh, start with a low 20s, 20 to 22 BMI, but again, adjust. And you may say, well, wait a minute, I've got more muscle than that. Okay. In fact, you know, there's an example of somebody with a BMI of 30 who had what? Less than 5% body fat. His name's Arnold Schwarzenegger. So if you've got a BMI of 30, you still might be healthy in this space. If you look like Arnold Schwarzenegger did, what, 80, 1981, the year he won Mr. Universe. If you don't look like that, your BMI of 30 is probably dangerous. Now, here's another way. If you don't have a DEXA scan, it's called the jiggle test or the jump test. And you take your shirt off, you jump up and down in front of a full length mirror and everything that jiggles is body fat. And you say, well, what's optimum? You know, everything that jiggles is body fat. <laughs> and you say, well, I got to have some body fat. Yeah, you got to have body fat, but you don't have to have body fat that, that jiggles in order to be healthy. So a couple of different ways of looking at it. BMI, BMI adjustments, and the jiggle or jump test. I hope that helps, Fort Worth. Great question. Thank you. Rick Folia, MACR, microalbumin creatinine ratio. My labs have creatinine 1.12, albumin 4.0. Is microalbumin creatinine ratio just the ratio of the two or separate tests? No, we're looking at creatinine in your, uh, in your uh, serum and uh, our creatinine and albumin in your urine. That's what we're looking for. Um, and you, you ask for that specific test and they will give that to you. So um, somebody gave us a super chat. Uh, I appreciate that. That super chat's an easy way on the videos, you know, the live videos to just make a contribution for us to get this content out uh, to the rest of the world. Um, uh, this was 1999 and I, I'm sure we'll get there in a few minutes. Thank you so much. Um, you may, you may have your issues with different countries and different governments, but people are people, uh, no matter where in the world that you are. And our number five download for content in the world, uh, the number five countries, China. So this stuff is reaching all over Asia, um, South America, Central America, uh, Europe, uh, some in Africa, not so much. Africa tends to be a much younger continent with a different set of issues. Dave, the retired cop. Good morning. Good morning, Dave. How are you? Uh, he also says, I had a CT three weeks ago and had a total Agatston score of 424, left main 27, left arterio anterior descending 7. That is Interesting, most of us that have a problem have it in the LAD, the left anterior descending. That's the first place that you tend to get it. That's called the quote, Widowmaker. Dun, da, da, da. I didn't do very well on that, but people have a lot of emotion about the Widowmaker. The Widowmaker, I've got calcium in my Widowmaker area and I'm not worried about it. Um, there's a lot, I, I would be worried about if I had soft plaque uh, and I didn't have the and I had a metabolic storm going on. Um, so interesting that you've got a, a right coronary uh, issue more than others. Have an appointment Friday. What questions should I ask? Well, it, you didn't tell me who your appointment is with. I'm suspecting it's with a cardiologist. And uh, I would also suspect that if it is, the cardiologist is going to focus on your LDL levels. And we've just spent, what, over an hour talking about how that's probably misdirected. Uh, the other thing the cardiologist is likely to do is start talking about, hey, you know what? Maybe we should get a stress test. And... Uh, <laughs> I, so obviously the point is you might be asking the questions of the wrong individual. Um, I mean, that's what our whole, that's what our, this whole show has been about, uh, Dave. Start looking 
where you're going to get some answers. Start looking to find if you've got cardiovascular inflammation. And, you know, if that doc knows how to assess all that, then you'll start getting down the right road and you'll start seeing and hearing a whole bunch of the stuff that you just heard over the past hour. But as I said, your probability is fairly low of getting that kind of response. If you don't get that response, um, obviously, like I said, we we're opening up for providing um, insurance based care. Um, and there are other docs in the world that do this as well. Rick Folia, EBCT. I see these popping up all over the place. What are, are they measuring and what is it worth? Um it's a bit, it, I tell you what, that's beyond my experience in pay grade. I've seen them as well. I'm not a big fan yet. And uh, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to answer that one yet. It's a great question. Pardon me. You know what? I think I, I should probably get a little bit deeper on EBCTs and um, talk a little bit about it but not today because I'm not prepped for it. Eric Kaplan, looking into mesenchymal stem cells via IV to improve heart condition. Well, good luck, Eric. It's theoretically a great idea, isn't it? But here's the problem. You just, and, and doctors are doing this all over the place. They just shoot a bunch of stem cells into your, uh, into your body and they hope that it's going to find the right place at the right time and do the right thing. Well, what's going to make it? I mean, this is based on an assumption that if they see whatever your heart condition is, you know, maybe you have plaque that maybe they see plaque and they say, Oh, okay, we're going to create new cells that go in and do what? Remove that plaque. Uh, uh, you know, the same people, I mean, the same people are doing the same thing for joint problems, you know, uh, cartilage problems in the knee. So it, it, you're just, you're assuming that you inject some stem cells and it's going to make everything young again. Look at the evidence. That's not happening yet. I, I, I'm, I'm sounding very critical and I am. And here's why. I've got a lot of optimism and hope for these as well. The problem is we don't know how to control it yet. I mean, there, there are reports where they did this and people started getting clicking when, every time they, they, closed their, they blinked their eyes. Why? Because the stem cells started making cartilage in the eye lid. So has it worked for a lot of it, these things have worked for sig, uh, a significant uh, amount of arthritis. I'm not aware if anybody's aware of significant uh, inroads into cardiovascular disease, please let me know. I haven't seen it yet. We're just, it's too early. And I am not going to depend on stem cells to, to protect my cardiovascular system. And I don't recommend that anyone else do that at this point. Brendan Lenane, my impression is that gastrocardiac distress, Rome held syndrome, is not taking, taken seriously in the UK. Wondered if hiatal hernia or PPI use could contribute to heart damage or cause calcification. Well, <clears throat> interesting comments and interesting, uh, interesting question. We do know that being on PPIs, proton uh, pump inhibitors, antacids, the really strong antacids for the stomach, does cause problems. Um, it can cause gas, uh, gastric problems, and it can cause uh, some kidney issues as well. Um, does it cause uh, cardiovascular calcification? Now, that... I mean, that's a new one. I think it might be based on the assumption that we're talking about um, uh, impacts on the kidney, impact on calcium. Hmm. I don't know. I haven't seen that before. It's an interesting question. Alan Turner, Dr. Brewer, you are right. 25 years, low carb, 10 milligrams Lipitor, 100 LDL, runner, treadmill, every three to five years. Doc says, great, A, age 75. Calcium test, 2000, LP little a, 220, CT angiogram, blockage, lesson learned. 
Alan, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, you know, I'm, I've been a long distance runner as well. I've done, I don't know, a dozen marathons, even did a ultra marathon and have done countless half marathons. Um, that doesn't protect you from heart attack and stroke and um, neither does Lipitor. Rick Folia, I had a stress test, sent me home with some pills. One week later, I had a heart attack. <laughs> Let me repeat that. That's not funny. That's scary. And that's exactly what we're warning. And thank you so much, Rick. It's such a big deal. You know, it's one thing to hear some, uh, you know, some YouTuber. Uh, yes, I, people get mad when I say I'm just an old YouTube doc, but because I do have a lot of credentials. I used to run the prevention program. I started off as an ER doc and used to run the prevention program for training other doctors in prevention at uh, Johns Hopkins. I've uh, supervised uh, medical staff with over 700 doctors multiple times in my career. So I know what I'm doing. But, you know, again, you got to think about somebody that would appear on YouTube. And most folks say, well, you know, most of the stuff I see on YouTube is junk. There's a lot of good stuff on YouTube these days. And that was one of my goals to bring epidemiology and a critical look at the medical scientific evidence as well as medical prevention to a, a, a media that um, that's out there for everybody and free. Um, so actually, folks, you know, some of the responses we're getting today, it, the, uh, the success of the channel speaks, speaks for itself. Um, but here's my point. It's one thing to hear a doctor talk about theoretical uh, statements about stress tests don't help. It's a very, very different thing for a patient to volunteer and say, look, hey guys, I had a stress test. They sent me home with some pills. One week later, I had a heart attack. Thank you so much, Rick, for sharing that. Johnny, the first ingredient of Indicalix Pro is fucoidin, brown seaweed. I tried fucoidin for a month last year. And my LDL dropped from 160 to 60 over two months, but I had a lot, of, a lot of muscle pain too. That's interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Johnny. Alan Turner, oops, Turner, low fat, not low carb in previous comment. Mm. That may have been part of the problem. Again, so many of us have carb problems that are driving this metabolic storm. And yes, the standard used to be low fat. I was on low fat for a long time and uh, until I demonstrated to myself I had gotten um, uh, carb resistant and you know that was about what 10 years ago so that's when we were beginning to take a harder look at carbs as a root cause of this problem Johnny F the fitness expert who had a heart attack Bob etc that's an incomplete sentence I'm not sure it's a sentence fragment not sure where you're going with that Johnny Mezzanine, cardiologist switched me from rosuvastatin three times five milligrams, three times per week, five milligrams, to Lobalo, two milligrams, three times a week, last February. At my annual physical, the GP was concerned about hydrophilic versus lipophilic thoughts. Yeah, I don't get too deep into the hydrophilic, lipophilic. You'll see that, that debate all the darn time. Here's one of the bigger is issues that I have, though, mezzanine. Rosuvastatin is fine for three times a week because the half-life for rosuvastatin is 17 hours. The half-life for Lavalo, on the other hand, is something like four hours. So I wouldn't go to three times a week for Lavalo. You know, Lavalo is a good choice, but not three times a week. You don't have that multiple day flexibility with Lavalo that you have with Crestor. John Panazzo. Hey, John, did Dr. Brewer mention products other than Indicalix Pro? Uh, the old Arteracil. Um, and I think I mentioned something else, but I can't remember what it was. Not in terms of uh, Calix. Um, and again, I, I think it's too early to say that, yeah, you just take uh, one of these Calix, uh, glycocalyx supplements and it's going to fix things. I will say, however, though, that I was surprised at the quality of the data. So for those of you that are... Um, motivated by supplements. I don't think that's a bad purchase. I keep thinking, you know what, maybe I should try this. But like I said, I'm focused in uh, lifestyle management and some other things. Rick Folia, are you familiar with Malcolm Hendricks's 
the clock thickens. You know, I've heard it many times. I've seen like a couple of five minute videos on it and I keep meaning to read it because so many people bring it up and say, hey, doc, this guy talks about a lot of the same stuff you do. OK, hid the the clot thickens and hid the on of and if explanation of plaque. Don't understand and hid the on of and thoughts in particular is LP little a, not LDL. Um, small dense LDL is an issue. The larger the midsize and the large fluffy LDLs are not only not an issue, they're healthy. LP little a is an issue for a lot of people. I've got, you know, given what I do, I've got tons and tons of people with LP little a, familial hypercholesterolemia. You know, we had a, a patient on that had had LP little a, what, in the 800s level, and he was doing fine. But I can tell you, again, cardiovascular disease is a multi-risk factor disease. So, yes, it's helpful to look at one item, but you also need to look at the others as well. Look at all of the things that might be driving your uh, cardiovascular risk. And I'll tell you, I mean, I've got, given what I do, I've got a lot of these people that have LP little a's in the uh, three to eight or 900 level. You know, once you start getting over 700, they start getting um, calcification of the aortic valve. Uh, but I can tell you, the vast majority of people don't tend to start getting many problems, even with LDL, until they, till they start hitting their 50s, like Bob Harper did, because they start to, uh, treading into that insulin resistance uh, component of their life. And unfortunately, the vast majority of insulin resistance, as in 90% of it, is never detected because Patients and docs make the mistake of looking at things like A1C, and that's that's it. So good question. Good. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. John Tocho, I still don't have the new time down pad. I need to create an arm. Thank you, John. So I, I and I knew some people would have some challenges. Obviously, any change is going to throw people. But we've had multiple. We get a lot of views in uh, Asia. And this, uh, there were, we continued to get requests to bump it a little bit more. So I think it was like late at night for them. It's still uh, late enough in the morning for the U.S. Uh, Californians, the left coast fe uh, people to be able to, to get there and get some questions in. But thanks, John. And sorry about the change. Bob Dylan, does an EKG actually show whether you've had a heart attack? I can, but not necessarily. Uh, that's why there's, you know, you have to do, somebody comes into the ER and if you just say, oh, well, I took an EKG and I didn't see one and I sent them back out, that would be malpractice. That would be a big, big mistake. There's other things you have to look at. Lately, I've had one every time I saw a doctor, four times, standard of care, pushes, stents, and statins, but not proper testing or diet. You betcha. You betcha. Thanks for sharing. Sharon Hawkins, thank you for all this info. <clears throat> well, thank you for your interest, Sharon. You know, here's the thing that's uh, that makes it worthwhile. Um, I'm, I stopped one after, one uh, morning. Excuse me just a minute. <clears throat> I stopped one morning to we took volunteers for the Medicare Advantage program or for the Medicare program. And we had about. Uh, We've had over 200 people. Just, we just sent one email out and 200 people said, oh yeah, I'd love to try that. And the average person said, and by the way, I've got two family members or two friends or a family member and a friend. So, I mean, just with one brief, almost hidden email, we got 600 people that said they wanted to join up. So we're not sending out more emails right now. We just don't want to get run over with demand and, um, you know, create some dissatisfaction. We're, we're moving slowly to build up. The point I was going to make, though, is that uh, on the first dozen or so volunteers in the state of Florida, I made some calls. And three times in a four-hour morning over about a dozen calls, I had uh, people say to me, oh, yeah, I'd love to. And by the way, Doc, you saved my life. 
and you and I've never talked, but you just, the videos have saved my life. And you could hear the emotion in the voice. And I can tell you, I mean, just you tell me what can be more satisfying than that. Sure. I love to play, you know, golf and I like working out and I love to travel, but there's nothing like somebody, you know, like you just did share and come back and say, thank you. Speaking of that, tired looking for name said, thank you with a $20 and, and put some, uh, some money behind it so we can start getting that information out there. If you're wondering how they do that, uh, Gilbert's showing you that up in the upper right hand corner. It's called a super chat button. He's showing you where you can go down, you click on it and you can uh, contribute. All this money, by the way, goes, it doesn't, I, I don't pocket any of this. In fact, you know, uh, Gilbert does a great job. Uh, we've got, we've got Gilbert, we've got Sam, we've got Jesus, we've got Michelle, um, and we just recently added a, an American a U.S. based nurse practitioner with some really good uh, credentials in this space. I'm paying for those with um, out of my retirement, but mostly from the patients that I do see. Um, the, these twenty dollars super chats help us to get that information out to other people that. Um, that need this care, you know, that want to live longer and live healthier, uh, most importantly. And we do provide a lot of free care as well. Uh, if you're one of those people that we've provided free care to, think about it. Um, if you actually pay for your care, then uh, someone else can get care as well. So think about sharing that. And thank you so much, Tired Looking for Name. As always, thank you very much, Dr. Brewer and the entire PrevMed team. Thank you, Tired. We appreciate that. Bart Robinson, Malcolm Kendrick. <coughs> hmm. Moon and back mommy. Doc, how do you prove HBP is secondary, not primary? And what is the best way to look for low level damage caused by HP, HBP? Well, um, I think your undefined acronym is, I'm going to assume it's high blood pressure since high blood pressure is such an important, in some cases, no question, primary risk factor. <clears throat> so why would I say it's secondary, not primary? I'm not sure that I, I, I don't remember doing, a, making a whole lot of statements about what's primary and secondary. I, I will say this though, I'm, you're, you are picking up on some subtleties of what I'm saying. One of the, and, and let me give you some of the background on what I think you're picking up. I do think that, I mean, so for example, with me <clears throat> and with many, many patients, one of the first things that you pick up in terms of going into this chronic disease area is high blood pressure. Does that mean it started with high blood pressure and the other things responded? Well, there's a lot of really clear evidence <coughs> that would indicate that the high blood pressure originally started from undiagnosed prediabetes or insulin resistance. What's going on there? AGEs. And I'm not talking about you're getting old, although that's you know, that's usually true when you start stepping into your high blood pressure in your 40s or 50s or 60s. But what causes high blood pressure? Again, look up AGEs, and I'm not talking about age. I'm talking about advanced glycation end products. What are those? Well, advanced glycation end products are proteins. Glucose binds uh, permanently to proteins. So I used to have a a, uh, a professor in med school. And back in med school, I was bored to tears with diabetes. I wish I had listened more because I had no idea how, much, how important that was going to be. He used to keep this little plastic model of a piece of muscle in his pocket. He'd always pull it out when he was giving a lecture and he'd say, this is your muscles on diabetes. And what his, his, your diabetes in high blood sugar uh, plasticizes proteins. I mean, so it makes, it literally does 
make something very similar to a plastic out of proteins in your body. And proteins do everything from LDL to HDL. You know, those are made by proteins to muscle to enzymes to everything else. <clears throat> so those things, uh, those are called when, the, when one of those proteins has become bound to glucose, it lodges in some of the, um, the pressure receptor areas of the kidney. And so the kidney's starting to think, I don't have enough pressure because I'm not getting enough flow through. It's not, it, it, they're not getting enough flow through, but it's not because of uh, not pressure. It's because the, clock, the pressure gauges are getting clogged up and blocked by AGEs, advanced glycation end products. And just a side note, if you're saying, oh, gosh, I've never heard of AGEs, advanced glycation end products. I would say, yes, you probably have. The most common advanced glycation end product is... I, I, would, I want to give you a quiz. I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer. Uh, hemoglobin A1C. Hemoglobin is a protein. It's built to carry oxygen. I mean, to carry um, iron, which carries oxygen. But A1C is an advanced glycation end product, AGE. <coughs> so go uh, if you've got high blood pressure, ask your doctor and, and go look it up. Just go Google it. What's the most common cause of high blood pressure? And most of the time you'll see, we don't know, it's called uh, essential hypertension. And all that means is it's high blood pressure, hypertension. And essential is a way for the doctors to say, we don't know what caused it. Uh, there's still not enough research because who's going to go in and, you know, dis dissect a kidney and find out that that kidney was driving, the blood pressure receptors were driving high blood pressure by, uh, by this process, I, 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 many of us would, would say that's probably the original insult. So Moon and Back Mommy, you, I, I don't think I've ever mentioned uh, things and delineated them primary and secondary the way you've delineated it, but it's a great question. It shows you're clearly um, hearing what we're talking about and you're getting deeper. Does, does that mean I ignore blood pressure? No, I don't ignore blood pressure. I'm on, I just, over the past, what, year and a half, transitioned from one blood pressure medicine to two. And that's one of the challenges and one of the the things that's that happens to us as we age. Brenda Lenane, thanks for great information as ever. Do you approve of Holter tests? Are they any real diagnostic value? Yes, I've had one. Uh, you may remember, I've shared with the group that I have atrial fib, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. It's something sort of like uh, insulin resistance that the vast majority of it's totally unknown. People will feel a little flutter or thump every now and then and ignore because it stops. So they go on or they may not feel anything at all. So what's the danger with it? Well, the danger is... Uh, Atrial fib, even though it's paroxysmal or happens occasionally and you don't know when it's happening, increases the risk for stroke specifically by five to eight times. That is, it's also by far the most common dysrhythmia that we see with hearts. It's incredibly common and like insulin resistance, the vast majority of it's unknown. In fact, if I weren't a doc that does this kind of stuff, mine would never have been diagnosed. Now, uh, well, it might have, because I did get at one point uh, when I was focusing on uh, doing some work for um, physician partners, one of the, uh, a, a really good Medicare Advantage program down in, uh, in Tampa. I was teaching, I was their chief science officer for a few years, and I was teaching their doctors how to make more subtle diagnoses, how to diagnose undiagnosed diabetes, for example, an atrial fib. Um, at one point over about a six month period, I started getting increases, increasing bouts of, um, of AFib run in more common runs. And so, you know, if you get too much of that and it stays, you really want to get your heart out of that by whatever means necessary. Uh, 
one of the last means to do it would be ablation. But I was actually considering it because it was happening so much. Um, and so I went to uh, a, uh, an ablation expert. We did a, a halter monitor and yes, I was up to 20%, but I still said, you know, he wanted to do the ablation and I said, okay, you know, okay, but let me make sure I've lost just a little bit more weight and I'm dealing with a couple of other things because there are three lifestyle things that are more effective than ablation. One is losing that another five to 10 pounds. And, you know, that gets back to that question about what's the optimum weight. You know, some of the, sometimes the optimum weight depends on your risk factors. Another thing is dealing with uh, sleep apnea. And I just shared with you, I've got sleep apnea issues as well. So I could lose another five or 10 pounds. I had some sleep apnea problems. And the third one was moon and back mommy's question and issue, high blood pressure. Well, guess what? For many of us, losing another five to 10 pounds decreases our high blood pressure and decreases uh, sleep apnea. Sleep apnea, not, not so much for me. Mine is more positional, which we'll talk about later. Um, but yeah, there are times when a Holta monitor makes sense. In fact, if you suspect atrial fib, and you, even if you do a Holter monitor for typically one to two weeks and don't see one, you know what the next recommendation is? Consider doing it for a month because, you know, who wants to have a stroke? Rick Folds or Folia, are you familiar with Malcolm Hendricks, the clot thickens, in particular with his throw oven? If explanation of plaque, I'm not familiar with the throw of it. I don't, I don't, you know, guys, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to look up EBCT and I'm going to look up Malcolm Hendricks throw oven. Don't know what, a, you know, a throw oven is. So we'll take a look. Um, I will say this though. I'm spending the vast majority of my time getting us up and rolling and able to see a lot more patients, very, very inexpensively with just a, you know, we're, we're getting the, the programs, the Medicare programs up and rolling. I'll take a look. Oh, and the, the plaque is LP little a, not LDL. There's a whole bunch of debate about, uh, you know, how much of this is LP little a and how much is LDL. L, LP little a, you know, most of us have some amount of it. The, the issue is there's a genetic predisposition to have a lot more. Now, some people think that it's actually LDL, both LDL and LP little a, which is a genetic variation of LP little a, of LDL. Uh, some people think that those are uh, really more of a response to inflammation than a cause. And I think there's a good case to make for that. Um, I'm not sure what else to say about that right now. Uh, Bart Robinson, Kendrick. Okay. Uh, Malcolm Kendrick as opposed to Hendrix. Okay. Kendrick. Mirden Emrys. Mir Mirden Emrys, 007. Are, are you, do you recommend a baby statin? Baby statin or baby aspirin? Baby statin. Never heard of that. For high LDL, if a lean hyper responder. So <clears throat> it's a great question. Uh, I've got a lot of people with uh, high LDLs. I've got a lot of uh, lean mass hyper responders. I've got a lot of um, uh, FH patients. And I've got a few that appear to be uh, very much uh, related. You know, I had uh, oh, somebody give me, I'm having a senior moment. I had, what's his name? The, the lean mass hyper responder guy on and he and I, had some debate because one of the things I said is that I think there is some overlap. I understand what he's talking about. He's, he's uh, saying that this is in specifically in a response to low carbs. And I get that. What I think. Um, oh, what somebody help me with his name. What I think he didn't get. And he and I discussed it a little bit was the fact that there are over 2000, different SNPs, 
uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. In other words, genetic variations that can cause familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, so anyhow, we, uh, before I go too far down that ac maybe academic bunny hole, it's not, it's a bunny hole that matters for some people. The question is, do I recommend a baby statin? So I, <clears throat> I think we're in terra incognita, uh, terra uh, land incognita unknown. I think we're in unknown territory in a whole lot of these things about just how much risk do you have? You know, most of the lean mass hyper responders that I know, I think have very little to no risk and don't recommend a statin for. Some of them say, you know what? Yeah, I've had this problem before. I would like a little bit of statin. Some of them, say, most of them say, you know what? I think I'm fine with this. I'm going to move ahead. Some of them go back and say, look, um, I don't, uh, I don't want to have the lean mass hyper responder bit. If I add just a tiny bit of carb back into my diet, it tends to drop my LDL. And, you know, it's like the old Westerns where they walk into the bar and they say, pick your poison. You know, I will give patients my, my, my perspective of the patient is that you're the de decision maker. You're the executive. I'm a consultant. Now they will say, you know, they'll go through all that. They'll say, fine. Uh, over half of them will give me their opinion at that point. But a lot of them will then say, well, I'm asking what you would do. What's your opinion? So then I go back and say what I would do. If I were a lean mass hyper responder, I would probably experiment around. I, you know, I experiment around a lot anyway. Uh, I might experiment around and see about how much, how many carbs added into my diet would drop that LDL level. I can tell you this, I wouldn't be worried about the a higher LDL level if it was clearly a lean mass hyper responder issue. Would I take a statin? You know what? Uh, not based on LDL level. I, I still don't recommend statins based on LDL levels. I have patients that are FH, familial hypercholesterolemia, that I don't recommend a statin for because we look and they don't have plaque. If you don't have plaque, why do you want to take a statin? Even if you do have high LDLs. I mean, you've been living 20 to 40 to 50 or 60 years already and you still don't have plaque, then even if you have high LDL, why do you want to take a statin? Okay, so low-carb diet and fasting, LDL went from 99 to 172. Uh, you're, yeah, you, you got some of that. Good triglyceride over HDL level. Local GM does not understand IR. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, that's not uncommon. Your reaction to uh, to the low carb diet is not very common. It's you know it's it tends to lead to toward lean mass hyper responder, but it's not uncommon at all for most docs to not understand some of this stuff. Johnny F, what is the best thing for determining diabetes, and how often should we test a uh, an insulin survey? You can look it up on the internet. Uh, Ivor Cummins has talked about it a whole lot. Ivor has sort of gone down some interesting paths recently, but I think he's started to get back. A lot of people watch uh, that watch my channel, watch his channel. Um, it, it's, we actually do the test. If you want to, um, Gilbert, if you'll flash Michelle's number up there, 859-721-1414, you can call and we can get you set up for one of those tests if you'd like. Uh, Rick Folia, how to find CIMT? Again, just keep the number up if you would. Our, our office can help you find theirs. There is a provider in Atlanta. There's a provider that goes all over the country. There's a provider that, um, there's a couple of others, but clearly Atlanta and, um, and Cardio Risk out of Nevada that sends people all over the country. William Brewster, any worry about radiation from angiogram? Very little, and here's why. If you get the book, we talk about the specific levels of risk uh, from angiograms. Uh, cath angiograms are a lot more uh, radiation. The CT angiograms, not so much. And clearly not the calcium score. I mean, they get less and less radiation. And they continue to, to get less radiation <clears throat> for all of these. Now, it's the 40-year-old who's getting multiple... Uh, cardiac caths, multiple stents, multiple uh, um, nucleotide um, 
stress tests, those are the guys that actually do get significant amounts of radiation. <clears throat> Excuse me. To your point about radiation, CIMT has zero radiation. It's an ultrasound. Calcium score, again, totally insignificant compared to the level of risks that we're talking about. You'd have to get a calcium score probably every day for it to start becoming significant compared to the heart risk, or maybe every week, but, you know, five is about the max for most, lifetime is about the max that people should consider, and so you're not in, even in the same ball, ball ballpark. Uh, again, CT angiogram is still young. It's still, there's a lot of work that needs to go into getting it perfected. Moon and back mommy, I would avoid angiograms. They are invasive and predispose you to harm, especially the cardiac cath angiogram. That's the, I mean, that's the problem. When we just say angiogram, it doesn't clarify cardiac cath lab angiogram, which I would not recommend, <clears throat> versus CT angiogram, which I think is a, is a viable option. Good point. Carol Adams, I had a Widowmaker six years ago and I'm on six meds a day, which I don't want to be on. I eat very good and I exercise, but genetically, I'm assuming I have high cholesterol. Well, you didn't. I mean, Carol, I can tell you, carb metabolism is many, many times, probably at least 10 times more important than high cholesterol. So it sounds like you're still, I mean, it sounds like you're still stuck on the cholesterol theory. And that is a theory. So I would... You're not mentioning how well your body metabolizes carbs. Um, you know, I hate to do this, but uh, again, I mean, because I hate to just talk about <clears throat> hawking our own business. But if your doctor doesn't know how to get a uh, an OGTT, uh, we do and we can help you. We do them all over the country. In fact, all over the world on a regular basis. And that's what you should be thinking about getting. And if you're not you're mentioning you had a heart attack, but you're not mentioning how you, well, you metabolize carbs. Again, if, uh, Gilbert, if you'd put that number up again, 859-721-1212. Thank you, Carol. Uh, please consider your carb metabolism. Rick Folia, love the book, but need to add a few words about how stents affect coronary artery disease. Well, thank you. If we ever get to a, Next edition, we'll do that. Uh, Drax of the North, good to hear from you, Drax. Is a sleeping heart rate with lows of 38 unsafe? Uh, I don't think so, especially if you're in good shape. Um, I have some family members that have just genetically low heart rates. <clears throat> They're not in great shape, but they tend to have low heart rates. The, prob the problem, usually not. Uh, there's no guarantees in anything, especially in medicine. But uh, if that's something that you just tend to have, or if you're like a super marathoner, both of them tend to cause low heart rates. Even during my marathon days, I tended to not get much lower than 60. My heart reminded me of like, you know, these Honda motorcycles where they were fast, but they tended to be more of a high rev uh, machine as opposed to a low revolution machine. Christy Ewing, is your A1C already, if your A1C is already low 5.1, pardon me, I've, I'm getting a little bit of a scratchy throat, low 5.1 from eating low carb, but your cholesterol and triglycerides are high, what changes do you suggest? Well, that depends. Uh, it depends on what else you're doing. It depends on what else you're eating. It depends on your metabolism. It depends on um, which cholesterol is high. How high is it? How high are the triglycerides? You know, if the triglycer, if your A1C is 5.1, but your triglycerides are up around two or 300, there may be a genetic problem. That's not what we usually see, especially 200 and lower. We tend to see more of a carb problem. Uh, and you can get carb metabolism problems, even though you are somewhat managing your carbs, which brings up another question. You know, how low carb is your version of low carb? So there's just a lot of questions, Christy. And pardon me, you know, the old joke about 
why does a rabbi answer a question with a question? Well, the answer is, I don't know. You tell me. I mean, <laughs> I, I, it, it's frustrating, uh, but I need more information than what you gave us. Um, and I'm doing the best I can to give that information out. Um, if you'd like to get deeper and, and share more of the kind of information that I just talked about, I'll be happy to, to take another shot. Tired looking for names. Sleep apnea is a very important issue. There's no, no question. I hope to hear more about this on this channel. Well, very good. Sleep uh, tired for looking for name. We uh, plan to give you some more information on that. And one of my biggest goals, we're going to, I will give you another little tidbit in that space, at least in terms of my personal stuff. My, um, so here's what happened on my last test. I slept, I went to sleep on my back because it, I, it, I wanted to elicit the problem. And I knew that sleeping on my side had really had a big impact. And on the test, they could tell, they said, well, for the first two hours, you were sleeping on your back and you had some significant snoring and you had some sleep apnea episodes. A couple of hours into your sleep, you turned over on your side and your episodes went away. So, you know, I'm not the same as everybody else. Each of us has a different story, a different set of issues. But as you're saying, uh, sleep apnea is a big, big deal. There are multiple ways of looking at it. There have until recently been very few. I, I, I couldn't find them. Uh, good ways to get a sleep apnea evaluation remotely. So things are changing. We're getting better access to extreme quality prevention services, like with us. Uh, now we're also getting better access to do that on a, on a Medicare basis. And sure enough, uh, the Dream Clinic, Again, I get no compensation from them, but they're starting to take insurance. They're starting to get out there uh, with good sleep medicine. Carol Adams, Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you, Carol. I appreciate you sharing where you're from. Uh, gosh, you know, whoo, we're, we're getting more, um, a lot of the, the questions just keep coming. Uh I'm not going to, as usual, I'm not going to be able to get to all the questions. We've gotten a few more super chats. Eric Clapton, for example. Oh, uh, Kaplan. Sorry. I bet I'm not the first one to do that. Thank you, Eric. Um, again, helping us get that information out there. Uh, and then there was another one. Jay Petard. Uh, 10 bucks. Thank you again, both Eric and Jay. I'm going to run through some of the questions that I, I can see. Aura Ruth. Good to hear from you, Aura Ruth. A prominent Israel man was in the U.S. fundraising March 2020. He almost died of COVID-19, but was rescued by experimental administration of stem cells. The FDA gave permission for that treatment. That is interesting news. I had not heard about that. And I, let me just say again, I share everybody's enthusiasm for stem cells. It's like there may be some fountain of youth or at least some very, very powerful medicine there. What's frustrating, though, is it's just like the early days of cancer treatment. There are no standards. We have to get to better standards in stem cell treatment. This wild, wild west makes it impossible to compare the results of one study to another to another. Thank you, Aura Ruth. Carol Adams, if carbs are the root problem, how many is okay to be consumed daily? Here's what I recommend starting with, 100 per day or less, <clears throat> 100 grams per day or less. A lot of people are going to say, oh, well, that's way too many. Ah, uh, you know, here's, I, I will tell you what typically happens. If you're standard American diet, you're getting 200 or more. I recommend strongly that you go through that painful, obsessive, compulsive week, maybe two weeks, where you count all the carbs that you're eating. And then you start seeing a lot of repetition in your meals. If you eat breakfast, uh, after three or four breakfasts, you tend to start seeing the same thing. Lunch and dinner, you know, maybe more, five, ten different examples. Then you start getting into your patterns. The next thing that you recognize, and that will set you up for the rest of your life, because now you're starting to get some traction and you, you're starting to understand um, 
this is my baseline. The next thing that you can start doing at that point is you have an inventory. <laughs> you know where your carbs are coming from. Is it from, I love to, I got to have oatmeal for breakfast. I talk to a lot of people that do that. Well, okay. Are there some things you can do to substitute that oatmeal? Can you decrease the amount of that oatmeal? Um, can you add peanut butter to it, you know, or a healthy fat to slow down that dump of oatmeal carbs into your bloodstream, you know, so you don't start off the day with a big dump of glucose. Just take your time. Start looking at the quote low hanging fruit um, where you're getting carbs that you might be able to substitute, decrease the portion of, replace, etc. Once you start doing that, you know, it's like um, it's like many other things that slip into your life. A few years later, you'll rec you'll look at it and recognize and say, dang, you know, I'm really more like 50 carbs or less per day. Some people are better off just going straight to an, you know, a keto type diet. Most people aren't. Most people are better off doing the process that I just described. Jay Petard, next question. How do we get a test order for small versus? We, we can do that. It's called a fractionation. That's what you want. Sometimes you see it listed as an N NMR. Sometimes you see it listed as cholesterol fractionation. And again, if you'd show the number uh, 859-721-1212. Um, 859-721-1212. Uh, I'm sorry, 1414. Um, these are easy tests to get. I agree with you, Jay. You know, the problem is it's just like insulin resistance, prediabetes. Most docs don't know to order it. Uh, I'm blanking on the guy's name. It was an interview with Peter Atia, and it's one of the um, better known lipidologists in the world. And he said, you know, he said the same thing. He said the vast majority of docs don't get a fractionation, cholesterol fractionation. And his opinion was the panel told you nothing. I disagree because I'm focused on the, I will go to a couple of things. You know, mostly I'll go to the, um, triglyceride over HDL ratio to, to get an estimate about carb metabolism. But I'll also uh, look at, you know, see the problem. I'll look at things like remnant cholesterol, uh, which matters. I'll look at, you know, overall cholesterol rates and stuff like that. But the fractionation is very, very helpful. And if you're not getting those, your doc's not doing as good a job for you as, it, as he or she should. Life with Tammy and Dean, your advice for Agassiz's score over 1621. You know, the most, it's not the most common reason for coming to see me now, but for a few years, the most common reason for coming to see me was that you had, somebody had a positive calcium score. And, you know, guys our age, uh, my, you know, our, when I say our age, over half of YouTube viewers for this channel are 55 and older. And that generation guys especially were taught not to cry. I disagree with that. I think that's silly, but um, where, and you're wondering, what's that got to do with this question? Here's what that has to do with this question. I've had more than one 60, 65 year old male sit down and tell me, well, I came to see you because my calcium score is over a thousand and I'm afraid I'm going to die. And I'm looking all, you know, I'm, I've done all this stuff about cholesterol and statins. And these guys, it's not unusual for me to be in a meeting with a guy with our, you know, a boomer guy break down into tears because they're afraid they're going to die because they got a calcium score over a thousand. And here's the thing. After usually six months, sometimes 12, you know, sometimes earlier, sometimes three months we get rid of all that crying and we get to a point where they say, you know what? I'm stable. I know what's going on. I've seen the Honda study. I know that now I've got my stuff calcified. I'm not at risk. I'm in a good space. So uh, the, what's the specific advice? You know, it is what it always is. <clears throat> First assess the situation. Look at root cause. Look and see how much inflammation you actually have. You know, the better you can, if you've got a whole bunch of inflammation and soft plaque, if you reverse all of that, 
what else are you going to get except a big increase in your calcium score? I get that all the time. I get people that come to me with a calcium score problem. Yes, they do have problems. They have a lot of soft plaque. Then they, they get their life in order. They lose 30 pounds. They, you know, several things. They calm down that metabolic storm and they say, I'm going to do a victory lap. I'm going to go get another calcium score and prove that I'm not at risk anymore. And it's the calcium is going to be gone. Well, not only is the calcium usually not gone, that soft plaque has calcified. So their calcium score has increased dramatically. So I don't get that that much anymore because I tell the same story so many times. People are beginning to get it. But if it's you, you know, it's still tends to be a little bit more of an issue. Well, guys, I'm a, uh, guys and gals, I'm about to turn into a pumpkin. I need to, to leave for another meeting. Thank you so much for your interest. Uh, again, for those of you whose questions I didn't get to, I, uh, I apologize. You'll have to get them in quicker next time. Thank you so much.